morning, everyone. My name is Ilfa Gilfanov. I am the CEO of the Hex Race company, the company that publishes uh, the IDA Pro disassembler and the Hex Race de decompiler. And today we will talk about uh, the decompiler internals, the microcode. This is a presentation outline. Uh, we will discuss uh, the decompiler architecture. And then we will go and check how the microcode is built in the decompiler. Uh, then we will talk about the opcodes and operands. This is the most interesting part of the talk. Then once we have these building blocks, we can talk about, uh, we will start with stack and registers, and then we will talk about other operand types. And then finally, uh, what kind of things we can do with the microcode. It enables data flow analysis, and uh, because of that, many new uh, analysis types are possible. Then I will uh, tell you about uh, the availability of the microcode and some time for questions and answers if we have time. I don't know. I hope that you've heard about our decompiler. Um, we have a decompiler, it is uh, existing it has been existing since 10 years now. Um, it is uh, interactive, fast, robust, and programmable decompiler. And it uh, evolved over time. Uh, even in the initial version, that's uh, quite uh, powerful. But uh, over time, we uh, added support for many, many uh, processors. So we can say that it's a retargetable decompiler. Uh, as you see, it uh, can handle uh, five processors for now. Um, and you see that it handles native code. It is not a decompiler that handles uh, bytecode like uh, Java or .NET, uh, which is also possible, but uh, we are uh, focused on native code. Uh, the decompiler runs on top of uh, IDA Pro, um, and the internals uh, were never uh, really published. So if you wanted to play with the decompiler, you could do so uh, on a high uh, level, um, but the intermediate language was never uh, documented. And uh, this talk will uh, uh, show you a bit uh, and tell you about, uh, about this, uh, the microcode. Um, our decompiler has uh, six phases. Uh, and in my opinion, it's a very good, uh, very logical steps. First of all, we generate microcode. Uh, then we try to transform it to uh, kind of optimize it. Yes, we, we use the, the same optimization techniques uh, as uh, compilers do. Uh, we analyze uh, calls, uh, we resolve memory references and other stuff. Then uh, we allocate uh, local variables generate a so-called C3. C3 is uh, something similar to uh, uh, AST. Uh, then we beautify it uh, because in the initial C3 is uh, quite ugly, to tell the truth. And then finally we print the C3 uh, in a human readable form so the user can uh, analyze it, uh, examine it, and uh, improve. There are some uh, uh, options for that. In this talk, we will focus only on the first two steps. If you are interested in the rest, uh, you can uh, check my Black Hat talk. Uh, I gave a Black Hat presentation 10 years ago. Uh, it explained in more detail all these steps, uh, except the first two. First of all, uh, the question is, why do we need the microcode? Uh, and the answer is very simple. Uh, we want to get rid of the complexity of processor instructions. Uh, because all processors have their own special idiosyncrasies uh, or uh, oddities. Uh, I will give you just a few examples. Uh, for example, the x86 processors have segment registers. The floating point processor has uh, a stack. Uh, the ARM processor has uh, thumb mode addresses that have the low bit set which is uh, ignored by the processor because uh, if you have an odd, on, an odd address like 13, for example, uh, the 
uh, the function to call is located at the address 12, but the last bit signals to the processor that when performing the call, it should switch to the sum mode. This is a very special thing. I haven't uh, seen something similar in any other processor, uh, and therefore, such a thing should not be present in the um, microcode. And the microcode makes the decompiler portable. We can, we can say that we just need to replace the microcode generator and we get uh, a decompiler for a new uh, processor, but of course, the devil is in details, and um, when I say just, it's a just on the quotes. Anyway, overall, a decompiler uh, without an intermediate language um, looks like a waste of time to me because uh, once you finish your decompiler, which never happens, uh, you will have to redo everything for another processor. And we don't want to support many, only one processor because there are many, many of them uh, very popular. Now the question is, is uh, implementing an intermediate representation or language a difficult thing. Well, your call. Um, how many uh, intermediate uh, languages do you know? Well, there are plenty of them. In fact, uh, LLVM, uh, Rail, Binary Needs as uh, Intermediate Language, uh, Red Deck. Uh, yesterday, there were two call, two presentations at Black Hat here, uh, and they were presenting intermediate languages as well. So why uh, do we need one more rep uh, internal representation? Well, <laughs> I cannot uh, reply this uh, answer. Maybe we, uh, it, it would be possible to use uh, an existing one, uh, but for uh, us, uh, the reason was that I started to work on the microcode and the decompiler a really long ago. It was um, in 90s. I don't even remember the exact date when I decided to, to create microcode. And that's the main reason why uh, Hexray's decompiler has its own intermediate language. So I started in uh, around 98. Uh, and um, well, I am very bad with names, so I decided, okay, it's called microcode. Why is microcode? Because every instruction, every processor instruction, is uh, split into multiple micro instructions, and one micro instruction does one thing, no side effects. It's a very simple thing, and that's why uh, the name microcode uh, looked uh, logical to me. Naturally, it is virtually impossible to uh, design something from scratch and get everything right. Some design decision turned out to be bad. For example, uh, we have a notion of a virtual stack registers. Well, a design decision that is taken at the early stages uh, is really difficult to fix later because there are many so, uh, so much code relies on it, on this concept, and implicitly uh, assumes that we have virtual stack registers. Well, on the other hand, I'm happy to tell you that uh, virtual stack registers will disappear in the future. Uh, microcode continues to evolve and uh, we continue to modify it, but once we publish, in fact, we already published it, uh, we will not modify it uh, anymore. We, at least we will try not to modify it. So what were my design um, uh, goals? Uh, when I decided to create microcode. The first and the most important thing is simplicity. Uh, we already work in handling very uh, complex things, so the simpler uh, we make it, the easier will be uh, in the future. As you will see uh, later, uh, you will see that I failed at this task, but uh, it is because uh, the real world is really uh, complex. But anyway, at the beginning, what do we have? when we start from scratch. We have no processor-specific stuff, one instruction, one microstruction does one thing, and there are very limited number of instructions. There were only 45 in 99, but uh, today we have 72 instruction opcodes, 
and just because we had to support uh, floating point arithmetic and um, other uh, fancy things. In fact, uh, what is good with the microcode that it can it really can handle real world programs. And initially, we started with simple instruction operands. Initially, we had registers, uh, constants, and uh, memory. Well, by memory, I mean the global variables and uh, stack variables. And we did, I decided that we consider only compiler-generated code, because when you talk about handcrafted assembler code, anything can happen. You cannot trust even a disassembly listing, not to, to talk about uh, microcode or decompiler, because it is possible to uh, to modify things that uh, when you uh, read the listing, you see like, seems uh, innocent say, uh, looking instruction like move, but in fact, um, when this instruction is executed, there will be an exception happening, and uh, the exception handler will do something else, not move. So you read the code, you see, instructions, but they, they, they do not mean what they look like. Uh, another thing that we don't care about, the timing. Since we will optimize the microcode and uh, throw away uh, non-interesting dead code, then timing will change. Therefore, no need to even uh, try to preserve anything. The instruction order, we decided not to keep, uh, not to preserve it neither. It is just impossible, in fact. Um, and order of memory accesses, uh, we will not also, we will not uh, care about it neither. So the, the easiest thing, I think, that uh, just to show you how it looks like, let's take these four instructions. Uh, very simple, x86 instructions. Apparently, we access memory. Uh, we read uh, from EBX plus four. Uh, Apparently, it is a pointer because uh, the next thing we do, we uh, read uh, a byte uh, from uh, EAX plus one. Then we uh, subtract 60, uh, 61, and if it's a zero, then we jump somewhere else. Apparently, uh, it is a fancy way of comparing DL against 64 hexadecimal. Let's look like uh, how will ha what will happen, uh, what kind of micro microcode will be generated for that. That's it. As you see, uh, out of four instructions, we got 20 instructions. And uh, on the colon, uh, just right uh, to the semicolon, you will see the addresses of the uh, original instructions. For example, the instruction at FB uh, got translated into uh, five micro instructions. Um, and the instruction at uh, 501 got translated into how many of them? Seven? Seven minus micro instructions. You see that all side effects are spelled out uh, explicitly. It's very verbose. So we cannot present this to a human being uh, because it's not that readable, not very nice to. Um, to, to handle. Anyway, so anyway, what we'll do, the next step, we will try to optimize it a bit. We will throw away anything that is uh, not, that won't be used. Uh, we will remove the dead, the dead code. And then we end up with only nine micro instructions. Another thing that we did with the microcode is that we uh, forwarded, propagated some instructions into another instructions. Take, for example, the very first instruction here. It's LDX, which stands for load from memory. It loads from the memory, and the offset is uh, specified as EBX plus four, which is an addition instruction. So the addition instruction got propagated into LDX. Uh, this kind of uh, makes the microcode sl uh, slightly more complex than initially, but on the other hand, it will allow us to represent things nicely at the very end, when the decompiler will finish its work. Let's continue. There will be further microcode transformations. I will not uh, stop at them in detail, but what we will have? Uh, 
we will first have uh, three instructions, and finally we will just have one very long micro instruction. This micro instruction does not really deserve its uh, name anymore because it's not a micro, it's, it became very, very complex instruction. But the other, on the other hand, it has a very nice feature of being translatable into C3. So if we uh, translate it into C3, we will get a very nice if, if argv, Apparently, uh, the initially the EBX contained a pointer to, uh, it was argv. Uh, then we just say that if argv11 is equal to a, then we do something. Well, I'm sorry that reading microcode is not easy uh, because it was not uh, one of the initial design goals. Uh, as you see, all operand sizes are ex uh, spelled out explicitly, and uh, well, the initial microcode was simple, but then it became uh, quite complex. So the translation from uh, native processor instructions uh, to micro instruction uh, have been implemented in uh, plain C++. Uh, for now, we don't use any uh, automatic code generations or machine descriptions to generate them. Maybe it's a good idea, but uh, so far, uh, I don't feel that we are ready for that. Uh, now I will just uh, go uh, quite, um, well, ho hopefully I will go quickly uh, and uh, tell you about the possible uh, instructions uh, that exist in microcode. As you will see, they are quite straightforward. And on the other hand, uh, these 72 opcodes cover all current needs that we have with real world programs. So the first group is uh, the two instructions. Uh, they uh, just uh, move uh, value, values from one place to another place. Um, in fact, we have uh, here L and R, uh, uh, left and destination um, operands, in fact, uh, all micro instructions have uh, three operands, left, right, and destination. Don't ask me why it's called left, right, and destination, but okay, this is like this. Um, here we have uh, load constant and move instructions. Nothing fancy. Uh, to represent um, real world programs, we need to be able to work uh, uh, with parts of uh, instruction, uh, parts of registers, uh, read or write only one byte or uh, part of the double word. Therefore, we need to change the operand uh, size. For that, we have four instructions. Uh, extend uh, sign or extend uh, with a zero, with zero field, and to take low or high parts of an operand. And here, uh, as in any other instruction, uh, the left and destination operands can be anything. It can be register, it can be stack, it can be um, global memory, or even more complex things. Uh, there are only two instructions that work with the memory initially. We have uh, store to memory and uh, read from memory. Uh, they have, uh, they denote the memory locations by using a pair of a selector and offset. Uh, this will allow us to handle segmented memory if, there is an, uh, if, if we need to do so. So far, we were using only um, uh, flat memory model. So the, the, this feature of microcode was not really used, but it is there for the future. We have a very natural and standard set of uh, comparisons. They compare the left operand against the right operand and put the result in the form of zero or one into the destination operand. So these uh, instructions are used uh, mainly to generate uh, processor condition codes. And uh, the um, destination uh, register is usually something like a carry flag, zero flag, and so on, but we don't really um, limit them to the uh, pre predefined set of uh, registers. So therefore, uh, even PowerPC, for example, with its um, four sets of uh, uh, condition codes, 
can be handled very nicely by the microcode. Then we have a, a natural set of arithmetic and bitwise operations. Um, nothing to say here. The shifts, we have only three shifts and no rotations. The rotation oper operations uh, existed initially in the microcode, but uh, later we decided to throw them away because they turned out to be useless. Um, we cannot represent them nicely in the, in the C language, and since our uh, target is uh, C, then it was not uh, really uh, interesting to have them. Nevertheless, the microcode can represent the rotations using a so-called helper functions. I will show you later. We have uh, the following group of very fancy and uh, odd uh, instructions. They are necessary to uh, precisely track the carry and overflow bits after arithmetic operations like add. Uh, for example, we have uh, a pair of instructions like add and then ADC. This uh, pair is used very often to uh, handle, uh, to implement 64-bit uh, operations on the 32-bit uh, platforms, or even to uh, implement 120-bit, uh, 28-bit uh, operations on 64-bit processors. And uh, to be able to correctly represent things, we need these odd instructions. Uh, normally, they uh, get eliminated during micro-transformations. Uh, once we detect that AD, add and ADC, they come in pair, we will combine them into one uh, big addition instruction and uh, CF add, for example, will simply disappear. Uh, then we have uh, control flow uh, instructions uh, like uh, uh, indirect, jump, indirect jumps and go to's. Indirect jumps normally should go uh, away after some uh, transformations. Uh, if not, then it's uh, bad luck because uh, uh, um, in C uh, language, uh, uh, there is no counterpart, there is no nice way of uh, representing indirect jumps. The calls, uh, there are two different instructions for them, uh, direct and indirect calls. Uh, there is a very um, tough uh, problem with the call instructions because when we have a call uh, native uh, instruction, uh, we don't know what is the calling convention and we don't know um, where is the return value and, uh, and this is one of the biggest problems uh, during uh, reverse engineering, during uh, decompilation, to, to determine them. And um, if we are lucky, uh, we, are calling, we, we call uh, a well-known function like close handle, uh, create file, then we know the calling convention and everything. If not, uh, the decompiler will try to guess uh, the, this information, uh, the calling convention and the um, call arguments. Um, and th all this information will be stored uh, in the D operand. And uh, at the bottom of the slide, you will see that how we um, represent the call um, uh, instructions. You see that there's a lot of detail here, and, um, and this detail is enough to represent, um, again, all real-world programs. Uh, but almost all, because recently uh, there was... Uh, someone complaining about uh, our decompiler not being able to handle uh, some Rust uh, language constructs, but we will fix that in the future. Um, the next group uh, is uh, the conditional jumps group. Um, they are similar to the instructions that were generating a kind of processor condition codes. So we have a jump. Um, very standard uh, set of jump zero, jump not zero, great, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, maybe the first and the very last instructions are somehow special here. Jump conditional means uh, uh, jump, uh, evaluate the left operand, and if it's uh, non-zero, then take uh, the jump to the destination. And jump table is used uh, to represent the switch idioms uh, in the output. Initially, we had no floating point oper operations, but since our goal is to be able to represent uh, 
uh, real world programs, then we had to add um, the necessary stuff. As it turned out, uh, it's not that big. You see that we just need uh, a few conversion instructions and um, and a few arithmetic operations. For, for operations like add, add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, negation, and that's it. The rest, like um, built-in functions like um, cosinus or logarithm and other things can be handled uh, using uh, so-called helper functions. I will show you later, hopefully. And finally, we have some, uh, the last group, it's called uh, miscellaneous. Um, the most interesting instruction here, I think that it's uh, the external instruction, um, because uh, some um, processor instructions cannot be uh, exp expressed in microcode. Take something like uh, load interrupt dis descriptor, or um, uh, system call, or other things. Uh, we don't, uh, let's say, uh, uh, square root, uh, we don't have uh, microcode instructions for them, and they are represented either using so-called intrinsic calls or helper calls, or uh, the external instruction. Uh, the external micro instruction uh, just uh, tells us that there is something that we cannot express in the microcode, but it helps us to trace the data dependencies. So we know, for example, that AAM will we'll use, uh, is it AX or uh, AH? I think that it uses the AH register and modifies AL. I don't remember what AM, AAM does. Uh, but anyway, uh, it just allows us to uh, trace the data dependencies. And uh, we also, the, uh, the instruction called uh, undefined is used to uh, represent, to express the fact that uh, something is spoiled in a way that we cannot predict or describe. For example, the zero flag after multiplication uh, is uh, spoiled. That's it. Uh, you see that it was not that fast and uh, uh, we have these uh, 72 instructions. Maybe it should extend it a bit, but I don't feel the need right now. It looks, it looks good, and I think that uh, uh, it will stay like this for a while. Uh, so now let's switch to the operands, because I dis uh, discover, discussed the um, instruction, of course, but it, I did not show you uh, what they operate on. Well, uh, if you take... Uh, um, Every, as everyone knows, we, uh, initially we had only two things, uh, numbers and registers. It was very simple, because we take a register, we put a value into a register, we know that it won't go away, it won't disappear, uh, it won't be uh, changed by uh, someone else. In other words, only direct accesses are possible, indirect accessible uh, access, uh, access to registers are not possible. And therefore, it was very simple to analyze things. But the reality is much more diverse than that, and um, we had to add a lot of new operand types. Uh, logically, we started with stack variables, then global variables, and addresses, a result of other instructions, and so on and so on and so on. The list is not exhaustive here. Uh, there are much more uh, operand types than the slides uh, shows. But anyway, just I will stop uh, on some of these uh, operands, and then we'll discuss uh, what, how microcode can be used. The register operands. If you work with XC6, you know that uh, it has a very uh, funny way of, uh, funny register set. We have EAX, it has uh, parts of EL, EH, and um, it's quite difficult to work with them. We don't want this kind of mess in the microcode. Therefore, uh, all of them are mapped to micro registers. For example, AAX is mapped into four micro registers. One micro register is one byte. And uh, this mapping is uh, very straightforward, very simple. Uh, it can be done uh, forward and backward. We can go back from micro registers to back to processor registers, and it uh, it helps to understand the code. And um, usually, there are more micro registers uh, in the in the code 
then processor registers because we can allocate them uh, as needed when we generate the microcode. Uh, once I implemented the first, the very first uh, version of the microcode engine uh, and added some uh, ru uh, rules to simplify it, to, uh, to optimize it, um, nature, uh, well, it was natural that they work with registers. Like, for example, uh, XOR AX, AX, it is the same thing as putting zero into EAX. Um, and I had no logic to work with the stack variables. And I was lazy and decided, why not just map the stack frame to micro-registers? Since we have unlimited number of micro-registers, we can just consider them as the same thing as uh, well, stack variables as micro-registers. Initially, it helped a lot because uh, I did not uh, need to um, re-implement or improve the existing optimization rules, but um, later it kicked up and uh, it, 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 by, it beat me because uh, um, there were many problems with the stack variables like indirect, uh, uh, indirect references to, stack, to the stack frame and therefore a stack variable cannot be um, considered as the same thing as a register it can be uh, modified by someone uh, using a pointer. So we had to, to uh, live with that for a while, but finally I can tell you that we fixed the problem. And uh, now the, this, the bad design uh, decision will go away. Uh, just to explain you in more detail where the problem is. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, the a stack frame of a, a typical stack frame of a function. Um, the red areas are the ones that can be modified indirectly. And therefore, we cannot really uh, reason about them. And um, we, can, we should not consider them as the same thing as uh, virtual registers, as, as micro registers. Uh, you see that in the middle of this uh, um, diagram, we see the return address. Uh, just below the return address, this is a red area, uh, where we have uh, saved registers and local variables, and be beneath it, we have uh, unaliasable uh, local variables. Therefore, we, can, we have to handle these uh, red and yellow areas uh, in a different way. Uh, for uh, yeah, the yellow area, we can, uh, um, we can reason about the, um, uh, the variables, we can uh, perform data flow analysis, while for the red area, it is, uh, it is also possible, but we have to uh, remember that any uh, value that we stored there can be modified indirectly. Uh, the initial uh, stack, registers, and constants, uh, these three operand types, they were not enough, of course. Uh, very soon, I had to add uh, standard pairs like EDX and EAX. I was, again, I was lazy to do so, therefore, I, I just mapped EAX and EDX so that they are uh, adjacent uh, as micro -re registers, and instead of having uh, two uh, separate uh, four-byte micro-registers, I ended up with a big uh, eight-byte micro-register, but uh, compilers get better uh, over time, and uh, modern compilers can, can use any registers as a pair, not only a fixed like EDX and EX. It can be uh, anything. It can be even a stack location plus a register, so a value is stored in two different places. The high part is stored in the location pointed by SP plus four, and the low part is stored in a register. And the compiler can handle it uh, nicely. Uh, since compilers do this kind of nasty things to us, we had to uh, introduce a new operand type for it, so it's called operand pair. It exists, it consists of two, uh, two halves, low and high part, and uh, the, these halves can be located anywhere. 
anywhere stack, registers, or global memory. Well, in fact, uh, this is not enough. Uh, since um, we, again, we want to represent real world programs, um, it's not, uh, we cannot, uh, we have to represent real things that are used by compilers. Uh, with 60, in the 64 bit world, uh, there's um, the ABI that is defined, uh, like, uh, on one hand, uh, in the 64-bit world, we have a better situation because we don't have nightmare of calling conventions. Uh, everyone follows a calling convention that is specified in the ABI. Uh, well, there's a slight uh, problem there because um, uh, Visual Studio on Windows and GNU uh, compilers on Linux, they use different calling conventions, but it's not a, a big uh, problem for reverse engineering. Uh, but these EBIs, they um, introduced a very complex rules to pass structures and unions uh, to and from the functions. For example, we have um, a structure. It is only eight bytes. So in theory, it can be passed on the register. And yes, that's what the compilers do. They put the entire structure into a register. But sometimes they do even nastier things. They pass part of a structure on the register and the rest on the stack. Let me show you an example. Uh, here we have a structure. It's only eight bytes. Uh, it has two parts. Uh, called, um, a division, the division result. It's a quotient and remainder. And we have the division function. It accepts uh, two values and divides them and then returns uh, the result in, in one register. This is a nasty thing. If you look at the uh, assembly code, you will see that uh, there's a, after the call, call uh, div, we have move sign extended uh, double word. Then we shift the double, um, the, um, the quadro word in rex by 32, and the, then we uh, extract the low part, um, the, the second part. To represent this uh, in a nice way uh, in the output, we need uh, to have scattered uh, operands. It's a scattered operand is an operand that uh, can have its parts scattered over different places, uh, various places. It can be uh, uh, registers or stack. So you see that the output is quite nice. We have uh, the result of the call is put into a variable called v2, and apparently v2 has, uh, is a structure, and it has two fields, uh, the quotient and the remainder. Um, that type, uh, that oper uh, the scattered uh, operands turned out to be uh, quite uh, complex things, and uh, we do have support for them, but not everything uh, can be handled uh, nicely. We are working on it, but uh, we are not there yet. Okay, enough of these uh, uh, minor details. Let's talk about uh, the, um, what we can do with the microcode and how the dec decompiler uses the microcode. First of all, the microcode, uh, as you see that the generated microcode was very verbose, and then we uh, perform the initial uh, pre-optimization step uh, that uses a very simple constant uh, register propagation algorithm. It's a uh, very fast and gets rid of uh, most uh, um, temporary registers reduces uh, the microcode by two because it also uh, removes uh, unused uh, instructions. And then uh, later we will use another algorithm that will uh, uh, propagate uh, uh, partial registers. For example, uh, we can propagate uh, EAX into an expression that uses only part of it. Uh, it can move uh, one instruction into inside another. Uh, it can work with uh, all kinds of operands. First, we do all these optimizations on the basic block level, and then uh, we build the control flow graph and we'll uh, perform the data flow analysis. Um, 
uh, for that, uh, the result of the, of the data flow analysis uh, is represented as a use and a de defined um, chains. So uh, these chains, the use def information, can later be used to, um, to do many things with the uh, microcode. We can delete the dead code. For example, it's at the beginning of a function, we uh, put some value into a register, but this value is uh, never used uh, in the functions and we can uh, delete it from the output. We can uh, propagate operands and we can generate asser asser assertions. Let me show you the assertions. Um, imagine that we have uh, a conditional jump, jump not zero. If EAX is not zero, then we jump to the block number five. Otherwise, we jump, we don't jump. We, uh, we just continue to the next block. Uh, graphically, it can be represented like this. We have uh, true, two arrows, true and false. And uh, if uh, we don't jump, then we can um, deduce that uh, EIX is zero. Since we did not jump, it is zero. So what we do, we generate an uh, artificial uh, instruction that moves EIX uh, zero into EIX. That instruction was not present in the native code, in the initial code, that, uh, in the input. Uh, but since we explicitly put it there, then it can be propagated and uh, EIX will be replaced by zeros uh, in this block and maybe in other blocks as well. So this is a nice trick to be able to propagate uh, constant values uh, over uh, basic blocks. Um, we have uh, really uh, literally hundreds of uh, very small and sane optimization rules. For example, uh, if you have x minus y plus y, it is the same thing as x. Please note that this does not depend on the compiler. We don't care if it's a GNU compiler or a Microsoft Visual Studio or, or anything else or LLVM. Uh, all these rules, they work regardless of the compiler. And uh, I'm happy to tell that uh, most, almost, uh, let's say uh, virtually all uh, transformation rules that we apply to the uh, microcode are rules like that. They are sound, they are simple, and therefore we are quite sure that um, the output will be correct. Of course, uh, there are some uh, places where the decompiler has to guess. For example, the calling conventions, the call instruction, and there, if you guess it wrongly, then the output will be wrong. But this is an unsolvable problem, and uh, we just provide um, ways of, uh, uh, for the user to fix these uh, things that the decompiler does not need to guess, but just uh, uses the information provided by the user. Uh, we have also more complex rules. For example, the following rule recognizes 64-bit subtractions. You see that uh, it is uh, quite complex. Uh, and uh, it is, um, uh, what do I say? Um, it, is, it looks complex, uh, the description looks complex, and uh, believe me, the implementation is complex as well. So uh, we implement uh, such a rule in C++, uh, and it is um, big, uh, but on the other hand, it works very fast because of that. We have tons of rules like that, and they work like uh, little ants, every rule doing its uh, simple job, a simple job, and the end result is, for me, it's bigger than the sum of uh, elements. It is bigger, and it's, uh, it uh, allows us to provide a very, very nice output, uh, very human-readable output. On the other hand, uh, one more thing that uh, why our rules are more complex, uh, because uh, take for example this rule, CMB43, uh, uh, it tries to uh, combine uh, two parts of a multiplication and generate an 8-bit multiplication instruction. Uh, there we have two instructions, multiply, uh, multiply and low, and uh, the low instruction, and between the low and multiply instructions, there can be many other instructions. Uh, the only requirement is that they don't 
spoil or modify X and Y uh, the operands that are, uh, that are used in our pattern. Uh, how do we do that? We don't naively check what is the next op uh, instruction after MUL. Instead, we use, again, we rely on data dependencies. We go and uh, uh, try to find where the low instruction is. We have also uh, interblock rules. They work on multiple blocks. At the, you see that if you have three comparisons, with some relationship between them, it can be collapsed into one simple comparison that uh, jump uh, if it's lower between X and Y. Another um, rule, another example, um, division by, by power, sign division by power of two, we uh, divide, uh, instead of division, uh, we, instead of three blocks, we, uh, we just make it just one block. Well, one instruction. Now all these things I explained to you about these rules, uh, microcode, operands, and so on, so on. Uh, what is the interesting thing for you here? The interesting thing is that you can use all these microcode and the transformation rules because you can implement plugins that would um, examine microcode find interesting uh, things, and uh, you, can even, um, uh, you can even improve things by uh, adding your own rules, by hooking your rules to the optimization routine. Well, uh, the SDK has some samples explaining how to do that. Uh, for example, we have an ARM decompiler has a rule that uh, converts in the indirect jump into return. But for that, we need to prove that LR is the same as the LR at the beginning of the entry point. We can do that by uh, using the data flow analysis. Okay, uh, therefore, I have to tell you just a bit about the data flow analysis. Um, you notice that um, to the right of the instructions, we have uh, U and D uh, lists. U means uh, list of uh, locations used by the instructions and D means defined by the instruction. And this list are uh, maintained for you by the decompiler engine and you can use them to, um, to uh, in your analysis. First of all, we have this list for each instruction, for each block, and uh, for each block, and uh, more than that, we have even may and my uh, must and may access lists for each uh, uh, instruction or block. And these uh, lists are very, very useful because they can, uh, they help us to answer questions like, is a defined value used anywhere? If, we are, if, if it's used where exactly? And so on and so on and so on. Uh, therefore, you, if you use a microcode, you can really uh, answer questions like that and therefore uh, analyze things. Um, well, I think that I will skip these slides because I lack time. <laughs> Sorry. Just a few words about the microcode, the testing, and uh, so on. Uh, we really try the microcode to be reliable and uh, powerful enough to express real world programs. Therefore, we test uh, the microcode um, extensively. We have a small farm of uh, tester computers running all the time and checking uh, if we have any bugs. By the way, we have very little uh, reports about microcode, uh, about the decompiler in general, because I think that it's thanks bigger to our uh, testing uh, techniques. Uh, uh, but anyway, if you find anything about the uh, fishy about the microcode, uh, just send us a message. Uh, we, are, we are happy to fix things. Uh, we really hate the bugs and we try to get uh, rid of everything. Anyway, uh, the microcode is available. The API is available. It's only C++ for the moment, but uh, the Python will come 
very soon. I think that uh, if not this year, the next year you will have the Python API, and I hope that we will show you some interesting uh, things that you can do with the microcode API. We will blog about it. Anyway, if you uh, have any remarks or anything, feedback about it, just uh, send us a message. Or uh, I think that I, have, I ran out of time, so therefore um, the questions will be uh, in another room, right? Okay, thank you for your attention.